Um, the, the, this next segment is uh, going to be about the current state of ALS trials. We have two speakers, uh, Jeremy Scheffner from Bayer Neurologic Institute, Merit Sikovich from Mass General Hospital. I'm incredibly honored to get to moderate this session. And um, Jeremy Scheffner is going gonna, is gonna to kick this off with a talk about innovative ALS uh, trial designs and how they impact therapy development. And let's see, Jeremy, you're, you're on. You'll just need to share your screen, right? Uh, do you see it? Uh, looks good. Uh, yeah, yeah, you'll just want to make it the presentation mode. Yeah. Well, hello again, everybody. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, just ways in which trials have changed in the last several years and ways in which they may change further as well. Um, no, no huge bottom line necessarily, but just a message that we're we're getting more uh, rigorous about how we think about trials and, and more creative in how we, how we design them. And again, same disclosures as last time. Um, so I'm just gonna briefly touch uh, on a number of topics in a, in a short period of time. Uh, one is a very uh, uh, a significant topic of current discussion, which is how do we uh, design ALS trials to target the most appropriate patients? And, uh, and what kinds of tools do we, do we have to, to employ to use this? Um, I'm just gonna mention this idea of diagnosing ALS earlier. Uh, this is something that has been hypothesized but never proven that our, our treatments may be uh, less effective at different phases in the disease and particularly uh, as, we, as we get later in the course of the disease and talk about ways that we can, uh, again, target patients according to the specific uh, uh, disease uh, drug mechanism and potentially where we are in disease progression biomarkers. And then a big issue that, that I think is becoming even more important as we potentially have more drugs available to, to treat ALS is how do we address uh, the efficacy of drugs in combination and how do we design studies that look at, uh, at the extent to which new treatments are uh, important on the uh, background of, of, of other therapies or can be used independently. So uh, here is, is, is just a summary of the two uh, Adaravone trials, the Radicava trials, the, the phase two trial that didn't meet its endpoint, but that led to a, a third trial in a more restricted population and the third trial itself. So <clears throat> On the left-hand side are the rates of progression in the placebo group and in the adervan group for both ALS functional rating scale and vital capacity. Uh, and below are the inclusion criteria that, that sort of governed the behavior of, of, of these outcomes. And so um, it's worth noting that, that this trial included patients who were diagnosed as in what's called definite ALS, probable ALS, and lab-supported probable ALS, according to a, a set of criteria called the modified ls scorial criteria. And what these, de what these definite probable and lab-supported probable me really mean are the extent to which the ALS clinical symptoms are disseminated through, throughout the neuraxis at the time of, uh, of, of enrollment into the study. And so um, while this doesn't include all types of, of ALS, the most restrictive, which is possible ALS, is not included. They, they, they were a, a little bit more restricted than, uh, than it's the subsequent study. Um, there was a vital capacity criterion that was fairly stringent, 70% of predicted uh, or, or greater, and a disease duration that was within three years of first symptom onset. And what they found was that they... Uh, did see a potential signal uh, the, um, in terms of ALS-FRSR particularly, there was about a 10% a, a effect or so of, of, of uh, slowing progression according to um, the ALS functional rating scale. And they did a sub-analysis where they looked at these different uh, definite probable lab-supported probable uh, diagnoses and duration of illness and, and saw that in their initial study, they saw a greater magnitude of effect in more disseminated disease and in earlier onset disease. So they, they changed their inclusion criteria for the next study and uh, 
drop this laboratory problem, laboratory supported problem, which is the least disseminated, and they shortened the disease duration to two years. So they made disease the duration of illness significantly shorter. And you can see what what happened is that the ALSFRS decline over time in the placebo group dropped by quite a bit. It dropped from 6.35 points to 7.5 points. Um, and when combined with a slightly more, uh, more efficacious signal on the Adarvon group, although only slightly, they reached a, 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 a uh, quite uh, uh, high level of statistical significance. And just to show that that wasn't restricted to the LSFRS, if you look at the placebo uh, uh, progression of the vital capacity, it went from a, a drop of 17 and a half points to a drop of 20 and a half points, presumably due to a change in, in, in the inclusion criteria to so select this earlier onset, more disseminated group. If you move to comparing this to a more recent trial of Amalex's drug AMX0035, um, the inclusion criteria were changed even to an even more stringent way to emphasize disseminated uh, uh, disease state at a much lower uh, time, time between onset and enrollment in, in into the trial. So in this, in this study, uh, the, the patients had to meet this criteria for definite ALS, which is basically completely disseminated ALS throughout the face, arms, and legs. And also they shortened the disease duration to a maximum of a year and a half from two years. And so what I've shown here in the green are the prior data uh, from the first of the, the, the phase two study and then the phase three study of Adervone. And then in, in, in red in the placebo group, the progression rates in the Amalek study. And what you can see is by changing these inclusion criteria, um, the rate of progression became much greater in, in LSFRS going from 6.35 uh, in, in the first uh, Bradicava study to 7.5 in the second, to now almost 10 points over 24 weeks. And the sim a similar phenomenon occurred in dropping vital capacity. Um, so that, and in this case, because but I think because of these inc incredibly stringent criteria, the rate of progression in the treated group was actually greater than, than in either of the Radicava studies, but the comparison to the placebo group showed a statistically significant result because of this arrangement in, in inclusion criteria. So the point of this is to show you that by designing trials according to, in, 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 by arranging inclusion cri criteria, we can select a group of rapidly progressing patients if that's what uh, is felt to be the most likely group to show a clinical effect. There are other ways of doing this um, and uh, that I'll talk about in a minute, um, but this is just a slightly larger summary looking at only one, one, one criterion, which is uh, to the disease duration, the, 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 the minimum time of onset to enroll into a trial. And these are data that I graphed from a bunch of studies, the AMX, AMLEX study, the uh, Darabon studies, and some other recent studies of, of, of uh, drugs that didn't show clinical effects. And if you look at the blue line, this just shows the, uh, the actual ALS of RS slope of the placebo as a function of uh, uh, disease duration. And you can see that as the disease duration is cut from 36 months to 24 months, to 18 months, the rate of progression of the LSFRSR in the placebo group during the trial uh, systematically uh, uh, increases. So again, a, a slightly more broad demonstration of the same uh, point. Other ways to potentially use inclusion criteria to uh, create a, a, a group of patients whose progression can be well predicted uh, are involve the use of prediction models. And this is a prediction model that was uh, uh, derived by the, the NCALS group, where they took these eight different attributes, age and onset, um, diagnostic delay, progression rate, vital capacity, whether or not somebody had bulbar onset, uh, whether they uh, were diagnosed at a given time with definite ALS, and whether frontotemporal dementia or the C9 or 72 expansion was present. And they uh, established a, a, a number of, of predicted progression rates, a very long, intermediate, short, and very short. 
And if you look at the prediction, which is the solid curve to the dotted line, which is the, the, the actual observed cur curve in a very large data set, you can see that, that, uh, that the prediction of survival, and, and this can be extended to various functional measures as well, can be closely predicted by the, this kind of, uh, of model. And so um, using a multidimensional prediction model potentially can help us really pick a group of patients that are likely to progress at a rate that we think is amenable to, to treatment, no matter what that treatment is. Next point I wanted to touch on briefly is a question of whether we want to get patients who are diagnosed earlier. Um, what I've shown previously is that if you have a short interval from the diagnosis to entry into a, into a trial, you can actually determine a rate of progression that's more rapid uh, than if you, if you have, have a, a, a more uh, a broad, broad set of criteria. Um, but can we move the, 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 the first event even shorter and will that make a difference? And um, I think uh, many people who, who think this is very important use analogies to other neurodegenerative diseases, in particular Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. Uh, MCI, which is mild cognitive impairment, which is the program of, 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 of uh, Alzheimer's, is also being uh, used potentially as a, a, a pre-Alzheimer's uh, period where treatment might be even more effective. I think there are reasons why this is relevant to ALS and reasons why it might not be. Uh, one caveat is that both uh, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, by the time that patients experience symptoms, um, there is very significant pathology throughout the, the component of the brain that is involved in that disease. So the disease is already diffuse and extensive by the time clinical symptoms become apparent. It's not so clear that that's true for ALS, um, especially given that ALS can be very focal in onset. And for example, somebody who may have uh, the onset of weakness in the left hand, but may be completely normal in terms of motor control and, and lower motor neuron status in the legs, in the face, in the, in, 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 in the respiratory musculature. And so it, it may not be the case that by the time somebody is diagnosed with ALS, um, their entire motor, motor system is affected by the disease. Nonetheless, animal models suggest that if you, if you treat um, pre-symptomatically or early symptomatically, almost all of the time, any drugs that are, sh that are shown to be effective in animal models are more effective the earlier you, you treat. And so um, a question would be, how, how do you diagnose a ALS early? And um, that's a real, it's a, it's a significant issue because the longest period of time of pre-symptomatic or early symptomatic ALS patients prior to diagnosis is, it, is the time before, between the patient actually experiencing these symptoms and them seeking treatment to fit at their first physician's visit. Uh, but there are, are ways that we, we are interrogated all the time. For example, Alexa and other voice activated dev devices listen to our voice all the time. And you can actually make, make, a, a, make a strong hypothesis that, that one could hear changes early. So I talked earlier about a, 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 a speech uh, application that uh, was developed by a group called Oral Analytics. This is a, a, a data that shows that for patients who have already been diagnosed, but for whom they, they, they individually and in terms of external perception have normal speech, um, this divide, this this speech app can actually uh, uh, determine that there are abnormalities. The blue circles are patients with normal speech as judged by the ALS functional rating scale. The black circles are, are healthy controls. And you can see that there's a significant shift away from art uh, normal articulatory precision that isn't perceptible to either patients or evaluators. And the ROC curve to the right suggests that there's a pretty good specificity in, of, in sensitivity in determining the difference between normal and ALS. So there is at least a potential way one could interrogate uh, the daily life in a way that might give us earlier diagnosis. Another issue with both preclinical evaluation and clinical evaluation is how to go from one phase of, of, of uh, study to the next. Um, I'm not going to really dwell on how we decide to go from preclinical data to clinical data. That's a, a, a very large topic for another time. 
But a big issue for us is when we decide a phase two study is encouraging enough to move to phase three. Um, and to what, to what extent can we make this uh, effort more effective? Um, one of the aspects that has been a problem for us has been that our phase two studies have used as outcome measures the same outcomes that we use in phase three. But the phase two studies are smaller, and so we generally are left interpreting what we think of as trends that don't meet statistical significance and try to determine whether those trends are strong enough to move to the next level. Um, we can address this in a variety of ways, one of, one of which is to develop better markers of target engagement, which govern our decision to go from phase two to th phase three. And I'll give you an example in a second. But one other possibility is to be more stringent in our go, no go decisions regarding phase two. And, and this, is, uh, this, this slide just shows a number of phase two studies uh, in, in, in trials that are both ongoing and trials that have been successfully transitioned from phase two to phase three and trials that have failed. So the top left is the phase two dex and pexhall study that uh, really, if, if it was the initial portion of it was a, a three month period of placebo versus three doses of, of, of the drug. And then there was a, a subsequent six month per period in which uh, the lowest dose, 50 milligrams a day was compared against the highest. If you look at the data on the top, those are the data that um, were judged to be at least somewhat encouraging uh, in terms of changes in the ALSFRS from placebo to uh, higher doses of, of dexpromipexol. And you can see that you have to use a little bit of mental gymnastics to really see that. Um, the uh, lower component parts, E and F, are uh, data from the second phase of the study in which there were more uh, sig uh, more evident trends uh, that, again, did not reach statistical significance. And this was a, a development program that ended in a fail in a, in a, in a, in a not successful phase three trial. Uh, below is, is a study of aramacamol and familial ALS, um, where if you look at the uh, A4V patients on the right-hand side, uh, placebo patients dropped over a period of time uh, 3.6 points per month in the ALS-FRSR as compared to uh, a, a fairly uh, a reasonable uh, decrease in progression rate of 2.6 in, in the aramacamol treated group. However, this was uh, nowhere close to statistically significant. These data led to a phase three study of, uh, of aramacamol in sporadic ALS, which also failed. On the other hand, I, I mentioned the uh, Radicava study, and these are the data from the phase two uh, trial that all resulted in a change in inclusion criteria and then a positive phase two, two trial, a, a phase three trial in, for, for, for Adarabone. And then finally, uh, on, on the bottom right is uh, a phase two result of a, of a muscle activating protein called uh, rel deceptive, which um, it appears to slow decline in the ALSFRS by about 25% over three months. And a phase three study is now underway and we'll, we'll see whether that's a, 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 a signal that is, is replicable. But this points out that, that you know, we are making decisions on non-significant trends for the most part. And one could uh, decide to be more stringent and, and really look for larger effects in phase two before we go on to phase three. What we'd rather do is decide that we can, can or, 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 or get to a point where we can really determine that our agents are reaching a specific target and, uh, and determine that that target is actually active in a subset of patients that we want to, tra to, to treat. Uh, these are data from a phase two trial of a drug called NP001, uh, an agent that was intended to uh, move macrophages and microglia from a cytotoxic to a neuroprotective state. And in a post hoc study of this, uh, of this negative data set, uh, it was determined that, that uh, if you look on, on the right hand side, that patients with higher levels of C reactive protein had a more, more extensive or, and actually statistically significant in a, mod, in a uh, nominal fashion. A statistically significant effect of, of reducing progression on the ALSFRS as compared to those who had uh, um, less uh, uh, change in, in C-reactive protein. Uh, a confirmatory trial in this case, in this study, in this, for this drug was negative, uh, but 
this may have been uh, an issue with uh, um, actually accurately de determining the, the marker rather than, than, the, than the drug if, itself. Um, the last thing I just wanted to point to, to address is that we, we are seeing modest effects in our positive studies. Um, Radakava showed a 33% uh, reduction in rate of progression uh, in the ALSFRSR uh, slope. Um, uh, the AMX0035 study showed about a 25% re reduction in rate of progression. Um, and people are uh, have raised the question of, I mean, is this good enough? Do we need greater effects of our drugs? And I'd make the point that, yes, we want more dramatically effective uh, therapies, but uh, to the extent that these effects are additive, uh, we, we may really get to a point of dramatically impacting ALS progression on the basis of combining multiple drugs that, that can, can be additive in terms of their effects uh, uh, on, uh, onto each other. And so these are, this is some just, just a way of thinking about this. Um, the bottom two curves are just the extent to which a daramone slowed progression of the ALS of RS uh, compared to placebo, and I've re-graphed it. Um, and that's a 33% uh, reduction in rate of progression from placebo. If we had a second drug that had the exact same effect, um, that reduced rate of progression by uh, 33%, the uh, ultimate period of progression rate would be this gray dotted line. And if we added a third drug with exactly the same effect, 33% from drug two, we would get to a point where we've uh, more than, we've slowed to the rate of progression in the LSFRS by two thirds. Similarly, if you look at survival, these are again, this is, this is a, a, a freehand drawing on top of the survival effect of, of AMX0035. Uh, this agent slowed, whoops, slowed progression by about five and a half months or 35%. Uh, if you had a, a second drug that had another 35% uh, impact on median survival, we would go from a, a median survival of 18 months to a median survival of 34 months. Again, not quite where we want to be by any stretch, but, but certainly a, a fairly dramatic increase. And a third drug would obviously have a, a similar impact. So I, I think that if we do the studies appropriately, appropriately to show that our drugs are additive, then we may reach a state of significant treatment uh, uh, efficacy without home run drugs on their own. But this has to be looked at in a pretty um, systematic way. Um, there are really only two possibilities to learn about uh, ad ad additive benefits. One is to have as a baseline patients getting maximally treated. We can't do that in this, in this country because um, we, we don't have universal ability to prescribe the, all of the drugs that we think are effective. And, and this is primarily due to insurance restriction. Um, to the extent that we don't do that though, um, by stratifying al along the use of, of uh, disease modifying therapies, we can at least get an idea of whether the effect of an of a investigative, investigational agent is additive or synergistic with uh, our existing therapies. And um, we haven't paid good enough attention to this yet, and I think we really need to. So uh, just a number of points that I made over the, over the course of this talk that um, I, I accept the idea that um, the absolute best way to reach uh, a more dramatic ALS treatments uh, uh, more effectively is to get better drugs. But I, I do believe that our ability to modify our trial design uh, to uh, select the appropriate patients in terms of disease, uh, disease progression, to look for targeted engagement and for patients in whom that target is potentially active uh, uh, can really advance our ability to, uh, to reach decisions more quickly. And in addition, um, you know, the ability to, to really look at additive effects is going to be very important going forward. So I'll stop there. Thanks. Thanks so much, Jeremy. <clears throat> um, I'm, I, I'm looking at the time. I think what we maybe should do is, um, um, uh, is move on to, to Merritt's presentation, and then we can take questions at the end for both Sounds of good. you. Um, 
as sort of one topic. That was fabulous. It brings up this really complicated idea of how do we move from one phase of trial to the other and, and with, with some confidence um, and um, big issues. Merritt's gonna talk now about the, the pipeline. I think these will go, to, go together well and we'll look forward to questions at the end. Sure, I only have a couple slides, so I'll leave time for uh, talks. Um, so um, it's actually getting harder to do a talk on the pipeline because the pipeline's so big. So I'll just say at the beginning that if I leave anyone's favorite drug out or your drug, if you're a company, and it's uh, uh, apologies ahead of time. I want to just give the big picture where the landscape is um, and uh, and a little bit with why I think uh, the platform trial approach makes sense in ALS, uh, knowing that you're going to hear a lot more about it tomorrow from Dr. Paganoni. Um, so I'll, I'll review some of the treatments are in late stage testing, what the pipeline looks like, and then a little bit about the platform trial. Um, so uh, we've, we've actually had some recently completed uh, late stage trials. I'm using late stage trial instead of phase three because, as you heard from Jeremy, we are often use the same outcome measure in phase two and three, and those lines blur often when you use ALS-FRS, um, and, and in particular, for example, the AMX0 035 study was initially designed as a phase two, and then um, when it was positive, is um, now um, under review in Health Canada and FDA for full approval based on that trial. So um, of the ones that are completed, green is a go, meaning that it's under review uh, at uh, two, two regulatory agencies for full approval. Um, it's, uh, there is a, a phase three uh, a, a subsequent trial called Phoenix with AMX0035 that um, it's just starting, it's, in, um, it's a global study, and that'll be more of like a conf confirmatory trial. Um, the ones in blue, to first in, I think you heard earlier, a neuron, uh, did, uh, those are phase, late stage trials that did not hit their primary outcome measures, but uh, were not also completely negative. They had um, some um, uh, interesting data on uh, secondaries and uh, pre-specified um, uh, post hoc analyses. So those are still under discussion about uh, how to best interpret those results and the next steps forward. And I believe you'll hear from your own uh, from brainstorm tomorrow. And then the ones in red were uh, studies that were um, clearly negative phase three trials. We haven't seen the full results of all of these, uh, but the levosimendin has been published that is it was an oral agent. Um, that um, uh, an early phase two study, it suggested that it might improve breathing function, but the phase three trial uh, was negative. Altamiris uh, was a, a, a drug by Alexion that was in a phase three trial as a complement five inhibitor, and that was uh, stopped early uh, for futility. Um, again, the, the, the paper is now, but it was a negative trial. And then also more uh, this year, um, the phase three trial of Aramakamal was reported as negative. Um, now we still have a lot of other trials in development and those here under uh, in blue are trials that are active. Either they're done enrolling like methacobalamine but we're waiting for the results or they're actively enrolling um, which is uh, all the other ones on this list. And like I said, there could be more if you look at clinicaltrials.gov it lists, lists at least um, you know 18 phase three trials and over 100 <laughs> 80 ALS trials. Um, so it is an active field and it's a global field. And the good news again for the field is that there are ALS centers with expertise in trial uh, execution really all over the world now. And sometimes people ask, are we running out of slot uh, or, or pay, you know, ability to enroll in these studies? And I'd say absolutely no, we're still, I think only enrolling maybe 20 to 30% of people with ALS. And some of that's driven by the inclusion criteria, but also some of it by access. Um, so the, these are what's in late stage, but the, the number of targets and the science and the ideas for what to bring forward actually are, is enormous. With then there's over at least 250 companies that, um, that are public about having ALS uh, pipelines. There's probably more who haven't shared that they're working on ALS. So there is really a need to get more efficient and, th and uh, clever about how we do trials so that we can find the best ones, uh, whether that's in combination or single. Uh, as fast as possible for our patients. Um, so I'm only going to highlight a few of these ideas because Jeremy talked a, a lot about them, but some of our recent success has been about trying to get a more homogeneous population, whether that's done clinically or it's done biologically, it really depends on whether you have, what tools you have out there to do that. And we've seen the success with uh, Daravone and AMX0035 with a more 
homogeneous, fast progressing group. Uh, this is an approach that also Neuron uh, took. And we're also seeing studies now just in some of the subpopulations of uh, the genetic forms. And as you heard from Dr. Nath, also based in, in sporadic, based on some of the biology. Um, so I just wanted to do a, one caveat around the Adaravil and the AMX0035, because I don't think what we want to see in the field is that now all the trials are that way. Uh, sometimes when you have success, you keep doing that or you try to keep building on that. But it, we are left with some unclear, uh, some lack of clarity about a few things. You know, do these treatments, um, is there a biological reason they work better in that, that kind of population of early fast progressors? Or is this just a trial design uh, approach that gives you an answer in six months? Or is it some combination of that? And, this, and the answer to this might really depend on the drug. But there might be drugs, for example, that might work better in the slower progressing group. So I, I do think that one has to evaluate this based really on the biology of the drug and your preclinical data. Um, just to highlight some of the um, biological approach, and people obviously are much more excited about this, but we're, but we're challenged by having some of the tools to be able to, especially in sporadic disease, uh, kind of target people based on biology. But the, they, are, they are definitely coming. And some of the examples really are the, for example, the retigabine study that used TMS just to pick people with hyper uh, excitability. Um, and the uh, lithium trial that's about to start in Europe, uh, just taking people with the UNC13 allelic mutation, and then the, the study that Dr. Nath talked about um, for people with um, presence of HERV-K. So we, we're getting there, but probably the basic biggest you know success is really on the genetic end. And, and again, this might be uh, missing a few uh, studies, but there are now uh, at least three programs in SOD1, an ASO approach, an antibody approach, and a um, AAV approach. Um, and this could get challenging for the field for a rare disease, but we're, we're certainly uh, not done trying to figure out how to cure uh, SOD1 ALS. Similarly, there's a big pipeline coming out for C9 ALS studies, in particular to uh, ASO approaches, also approach for, for uh, transposon and uh, progranulin and then metformin. So uh, it's starting to um, beg the question of whether we need a platform trial approach for C9 as well. And then we also have um, in late stage testing a uh, ASO approach for FUS uh, ALS. So a lot of activity in the genetic end of, of ALS. And I do think we're at the beginning that even though that, for example, Tiferson might not have hit his primary, I think there's lots of lessons learned there and there probably is a signal there. And just like, um, you know, maybe the first bone marrow transplants didn't, didn't work as, as people wanted, they eventually worked. I think we're at that stage in this field. We're also seeing an ASO approach for sporadic disease and these two of the targets are taxin 2 and staphylin 2, but I, I think we're going to see many more of these. Um, and, and in fact, you just heard of another one uh, from Dr. Nath. And then there's at least 41 active trials right now that are phase one and two. Again, this is uh, globally. Um, so a lot of activity here. And so uh, about two or three years ago, we started to think as a field about whether we needed another approach to go more rapidly through these um, the big pipeline. And so we launched um, in July of 2020, the first platform trial in ALS. And this is done with the Northeast ALS Consortium. The idea here is to build this infrastructure, test multiple drugs at the same time, share the common uh, placebo group, and also share the infrastructure so that when you add a fourth or fifth drug, it's much more efficient and you're just uh, amending the protocol. And this is also a great way to learn about biomarkers and new discoveries in the field. And you'll get a whole uh, talk tomorrow by Dr. Paganoni on this. I just wanna say that to be able to do this, uh, it was a whole community that we met often with, with many of you in the audience, uh, the industry and our, our patient advocates and investigators to design what we thought at that point was, was the best approach for like a late stage uh, trial in a platform format. We started with three drugs, Zalucoplan, the Dipistat, and CNM AU8, and those are all fully enrolled now. We expect results next summer. Uh, we added the fourth one, Pridopadine, and then to add that, it was a nine to, I think a nine or 11 day IRB review and 30 day. That's where you get the efficiencies, uh, well, some of the efficiencies in time. And we're just adding uh, the fifth one, Trilos, and you're going to hear from them uh, tomorrow on their science. So this is uh, up and running. It's enrolling uh, very well. Um, and uh, it's really a partnership with uh, the sites and the patients and the companies. And again, we'll have our first results from this uh, next summer. 
Uh, we are um, looking to add, we'd like to add two or three drugs a year. Um, if anyone is interested um, uh, to, uh, to learn more about it or to join, uh, this is the new fancy thing. You can uh, look at this QR code or you can go to our website for an application form. Uh, but we're very eager to kind of keep this running um, as, as drugs are ready to, for this later stage of development. And so I just wanted to thank uh, the team at the Healy Center and Niels um, and all these great foundations that have partnered with us to, to really um, kind of push the envelope on how fast we uh, uh, bring things forward into trials for our patients. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was, that was fabulous. So great talks. Thank you both. Um, we have a couple of questions. Um, now, would, now is a good time for people to type them in if they, if they have other questions. Um, the one one sort of comment or, or question that came in is about um, about sort of our our decision to go from phase two into phase three or even phase one into phase two, and it's about the fact that we focus a lot on what we call CNS penetration, but the EMA has pointed out that most drugs will penetrate into the CSF, but maybe not into the cortex. And and I wonder whether either of you, of you wanted to comment on, you know, how that might be important for some of our recent results, for example, tofersin. Um, there are obviously challenges in testing tissue in, in, when you have a CNS disease. I can take a crack at that first. I mean, so to first, and there's a lot known about brain penetration. And so that's a case where, you know, somebody took that on up front. Uh, but you're right, uh, whoever asked the question that, that being in the CSF does not mean being in the brain. And um, a whole large number of, of, of agents in one category, the nerve growth factors, which were uh, up and coming uh, potential treatments in the, in, in the 90s through early 2000s, um, were often administered into the CSF. Um, but when it was looked at later, uh, it was realized that that's where they stayed. They really didn't get any significant penetration. And so <clears throat> so it's it's really an open question whether, whether any of those tar, uh, any of those agents have really been disqualified in terms of mechanism because that's not clear that they've gotten a good test. So yes, uh, uh, no question that that's a significant issue, and I think smarter people than I have to figure that out. Yeah, <laughs> not 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 smarter than you, but uh, I do think it is really important to figure out before you go into your human trial, and I do think that actually the traversal is a great example of of extensive work to, to work that out before. And so we have great confidence that it gets out into the spinal cord. So um, another question that came in is that uh, I think strikes at kind of the heart of this decision to go from phase two to phase three, but also, you know, merits some of, and so, you know, Jeremy, you talked about that, but merits some of what you talked about in sort of, um, you know, building from the biology of the disease into a pipeline. And that is the success of AMX 035 is encouraging it's unclear exactly how the how the combination or the stoichiometry of that was arrived at, um, and I, you know, I, you know, it, it clearly highlights the fact that not everything goes through exactly these same steps. And how do we deal with that when we're doing drug development? Um, Merit, do you want to start, and then maybe Jeremy go next? Sure. I mean, I, I, I um, for that particular example, it was done really, I think, in, in two ways. One is in the preclinical models and in vitro models of uh, neural injury of uh, testing different uh, stoichiometric metric uh, combinations, and also that each alone was also tested in uh, studies, small studies in people to work out dosing. So it was really a combination of both some human data and some preclinical data. Um, but but you uh, but the question is right is that um, at some point you do want to do some dose ranging even for the combination drugs and the question always is, do you do that in your first study or do you do that later in your studies? And I, I do think there's, you know, there's pros and cons to both, both approaches. I guess I would just add that this, the two recent positive studies that will have led to one approval and will hopefully lead to another should be a le lesson for us in humility because, um, the, the, you know, while there are some data to suggest uh, preclinical effects, they were not terribly strong. Uh, in particular, Radicava um, had very modest effects on stroke that, that didn't lead to approval in, in the US. Um, and it was just sort of a flyer that uh, the drug company gave free drug to a group of people who just wanted to try it in ALS. And they picked a, a dosing regimen that was exactly modeled on stroke and, 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 uh, and, and led, led to a positive study. But um, 
you know, there are, I, I think we could all point to our favorite development programs that seem to be based on stronger preclinical -pre data that didn't lead to positive phase three data. Uh, and, and, you know, the AMLEX development program did have some preclinical -pre support, but I, I don't think anybody would really argue that it, it had the strength that some other programs did in that regard, but led to a, a, a clear clinical effect. Um, I think dosing is critical, and, and, and Ms. Mert said you can make a decision of when you study it. I, I just, from watching the way drugs get developed, it seems that if you don't really look at dose early, you tend to never look at drug at dose. And so I, I think that's a, a lesson really to, 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 to be th thoughtful about really exploring all the possible dose, com, uh, dose dosing uh, uh, regimens, but also dose levels before you get to a point where you know, you really have to, to ask your phase three question. Yeah. I'd add to that. I, I agree. It's much better to do it early if you can, if, you, if a company can afford it. Uh, you know, I, I'd say that Daryl is having a post-marketing um, dose, a second dosing study that was required. It's now a, one of the phase three trials of yeah. daily dosing. Anyway, there's different ways to do this, but they were lucky. Yeah, I, I agree with the luck part. Yeah. If I could just make a comment based on long experience in, in commercial drug development, uh, it turns out to be time is the issue, right? Uh, because you have to think about patent protection. And so a lot of drug companies just don't do dose ranging anymore. Phase two is just really not done anymore. I mean, yeah, they'll do a phase two study, but they won't true, do true dose ranging. It takes too much time. So they end up just spending more money and studying more than one dose in phase three. So that's kind of what drug development is headed. Mm -hmm. I make the comment that a lot of what mid-sized companies do is not do true, true, true dose ranging studies and then go into phase three with a guess, which, you know, you know is, is not good for any of us. Yeah, and, and speaks to this, you know, this, the challenges of how do we get to where we're going as fast as we can. This actually brings up kind of the, the next question, which is, you know, Merritt, you mentioned 250 drugs in development or, or, or potentially in development. And, and the question is about sort of, you know, where are the bottlenecks? Obviously the Healy platform trial is, is meant to address some of those bottlenecks, but can it be scaled to accommodate this? How do we deal with this, you know, huge influx of possible treatments? Sure. Yeah, and I'm glad the questions were asked, but I didn't mean to imply there's 250 50 drugs ready to go to people now. There's just, there's 250 companies at least working on ALS. And some of those, mm -hmm are just in target identification in, in early days and it could be years away and the other ones are closer. I, I think there's there's a number of gaps um, and um, you know, one of them we, we're tackling with the platform trial, but there are also gaps where people, companies have good ideas, but they're, they need to fundraise in order to finish the talks and finish everything needed to get into people. Um, so there, there's a number of, of opportunities there um, to, to try to speed up the process. Great. And, and one more question, um, which is, has to do with long-term uh, longitudinal follow-up of some of the quote-unquote failed trials, some of the negative trials. Um, and, and we'll extend that just to trials in general, um, with the question being, you know, is it possible that there were responders that we could identify by going back to look at, at long-term follow-up? But I would actually extend that question to just say, you know, how, how, are, how are companies now beginning to, or investigators beginning to incorporate longer-term follow-up into trial designs now? So two parts. One is, can we look back at previous trials? And the other is, how are we using long-term follow-up now? Merritt, you want to start with that? Oh, sure. I, I, so I, I, right. I do think we should try to follow people long-term if we can. And with these predictive algorithms that are coming out, like what Jeremy talked about with NCALS, there might be a way to learn from them. But it's very hard with small numbers and, and um, lack of, uh, I guess, the controls. And just a comment about responder analyses. I mean, I, I think... It's an attractive concept, but it really, I think, gains power if we know that somebody's a responder with regard to a given mechanism, that the target has been altered and that, that, and that that's associated with, with some clinical benefit. Right now, what we're stuck with when we talk about responder analysis are people who tend to, risk to be progressing very slowly, which we know is a characteristic of some people with ALS. And I, I, I well, I think it's a worthy question. I think the odds on really understanding things better by looking at people who just happen to respond, fa uh, uh, who happen to progress faster versus slower, is it's a it's a distinction without a true difference, and I'm not sure it's going to be helpful. Yeah. So important distinction between kind of you know um, maybe some anecdotes coming out of out of trials 
and really building in, you know, follow up into into trials. And and you know, I would just, I guess, I would note that the AMX 035 study did have some, you know, some longer term follow up built in, not not super long years and years, but following everybody as long as they could and going back to to kind of be able to look at survival over a longer period of time than than typically. Um, I think we're gonna we're gonna stop here. Um, it's been a, a full and uh, exciting day. Um, I'm really looking forward to tomorrow. Tomorrow, we're going to get the company perspective on a lot of uh, therapies in development. Some of these questions will be addressed in, I think, some of the presentations tomorrow. Um, and that, I think that'll be really interesting to see how these concepts uh, really kind of meet with the practicalities in, in terms of, of drug development. There are many, many exciting things in development. We'll hear about a number of them tomorrow.